predators. Their acts are evil. We call them monsters. We say no human could perpetrate the crimes they have committed. But in truth, only human beings execute these horrific acts. And if you're like me, you want to know why. To find out, join me, Ariel Cooksey, on my podcast, Malice. As a social psychologist, I dig into the psychology, sociology, neurobiology, child development, trauma, and other factors that come together to create malicious offenders. Find Malice wherever you listen to podcasts. This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 54, Madeline Rose Stokes. On May 25, 2017, two-year-old Madeline Rose Stokes was rushed to the hospital in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, unresponsive and suffering from infected third-degree burns that had been inflicted in the family's bathtub five days prior. Her parents, Shane Stokes and Nicole Moore, had not sought medical care for their little girl's worsening condition, calling emergency services only when she stopped breathing. Several hours later, Maddie was dead. This is a story of bad decisions, selfishness, mental illness, and medical neglect. It's also the story of a tiny, defenseless toddler who suffered unimaginable pain for five days with severe, untreated burns covering a fifth of her little body which finally succumbed to the resultant infection running rampant through her bloodstream. This is the horrific story of Madeline Rose Stokes. My sources for this week were Yahoo News Australia, Facebook, Seven News, The Brisbane Times, ABC Australia, myjc.com.au, The Sun, news.com.au, Kidspot, The Career Mail, The Wall Street Journal, The Daily Mail Australia, Healthline, Crime Online, and court documents. Before I jump in, I'd like to give a quick shout out to my newest patrons, Nikki from Philadelphia and Bridget from Texas. Thank you so much for your pledges. Every contribution brings me closer to my ultimate goal of devoting myself full time to the podcast and the blog on a permanent basis. To make a monthly pledge to Suffer the Little Children, you can visit SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com and click Become a Patron in the upper right hand corner. To make a one-time donation, you can visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com slash support. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Now, this story made international news a few weeks ago when Maddie's parents were finally sentenced, and my research into the case has left me gutted. This one is not for the faint of heart. The torture this baby endured for five full days is almost too gruesome to imagine. But more importantly, Maddie deserves to be remembered. And if she had to go through that hell of pain and suffering, the very least I can do is tell her story to you. Just be warned, though, it's a rough one. Shane David Stokes was born in Brisbane, the capital city of Queensland, which is a state in northeastern Australia. By all accounts, Shane did not have an easy childhood. He was the youngest of three brothers, all of whom were raised by their maternal grandparents. He last had contact with his parents when he was eight years old. Their grandmother died when Shane was about 10 or 11, leaving the three boys alone with their grandfather, who was reportedly aggressive and inattentive to the needs of his grandsons, for whom he did not provide a healthy or happy home environment. While growing up, Shane endured physical abuse from his older brothers whenever they became drunk. One of his brothers later said Shane was sexually assaulted by their grandfather after their grandmother's death, although Shane said the assault was committed by that brother, not by their grandfather. At the age of 14, Shane moved out of his grandfather's home and in with his older brother, where he stayed until he was 16 and could no longer stand the ever-present conflict with his brother. 
At that point, although he was still in secondary or high school, he moved out and lived on his own. Suffering from depression, Shane soon became homeless and ended up living on the street for a time. Eventually, he completed his education through Australia's Technical and Further Education program. Throughout his teen years, Shane abused marijuana. He was able to quit for a while when he was about 19, but he ultimately resumed sometime in his 20s. Nicole Betty Moore was born and raised in Perth, the capital city of the state of Western Australia. Nicole's early life was no easier than Shane's. She never met her father, and when she was four, her mother formed a relationship with a man who was abusive to Nicole, both verbally and physically. Her mother did not protect her from this man's aggression, and on top of that, Nicole was reportedly bullied at school, so she had no reprieve from constant abuse. Nicole later claimed that at age 14, she was sexually assaulted but did not report it at the time. At a very young age, Nicole and her boyfriend, Jamie Jones, discovered that she was pregnant. She was 16 when she gave birth to the couple's daughter, who I'll call H.J. going forward. Reportedly, within days of the baby's birth, Jamie cut off all contact with Nicole and his daughter. Nicole wouldn't go long without a male partner, however. In 2011, at age 17, Nicole met Shane Stokes in Western Australia. Shane would later admit that of the two of them, he had the stronger personality, describing Nicole as meek and mild. The new couple soon moved to Brisbane, where they lived for a while with one of Shane's older brothers, Glenn Stokes. In 2012, at age 18, Nicole was diagnosed with anxiety and depression. Shane also clearly suffered from some type of mental illness, although he would not be officially diagnosed for another two years. Nicole would go through a variety of different antidepressant prescriptions over the next several years. In late 2013, Nicole became pregnant by Shane, and around early 2014, they were evicted from their home for failing to pay rent in the months leading up to the baby's birth. It was also 2014 when Shane was assessed at Banyo Medical Center in Brisbane, where he finally began treatment for depression. He was prescribed two medications, Effexor and Avanza, the generic names for which are venlafaxine and mirtazapine. On June 20, 2014, Madeline Rose Ava Stokes was born. In 2015, Glenn Stokes reported his brother and sister-in-law to authorities after his infant niece, Maddie, appeared concerningly malnourished. This report led to Shane and Nicole being charged with child cruelty. They ultimately pleaded guilty to a diminished charge of failing to provide the necessities of life, for which they were sentenced to 18 months on good behavior bonds, and no conviction was ultimately recorded. A good behavior bond is essentially the same as probation here in the United States. After Glenn made the report against Shane and Nicole, they cut off all contact with him, even moving without providing a forwarding address. Eventually, Shane, Nicole, H.J., and little Maddie ended up applying and qualifying for low-income housing and they moved into a townhouse in a public housing complex at 158 Ridge Street in the Northgate suburb of Brisbane, which was about 9 kilometers or 5.6 miles from the center of Brisbane. Their townhouse, Unit 4, was one of seven brick townhouses that formed the public housing complex, located near the Northgate train station. Their unit, along with three others, was located at the back of the complex, with the other three in front. In the center was a paved courtyard, and their unit had a tiny backyard. While living at the Ridge Street address, Shane and Nicole were both unemployed, and they didn't own a car. Despite her parents' unemployment, five-year-old H.J. attended the Northgate Early Childhood Center, which was only about 500 meters, or about a third of a mile, from the family's townhouse. I could find no information anywhere confirming that Maddie attended daycare, although a couple of the very few available photos of Maddie depict her playing at what appears to be a childcare center. Shane, Nicole, and the girls essentially kept to themselves and did not know any of their neighbors. The relationship between Shane and Nicole was not exactly idyllic. Nicole later reported that Shane had a short fuse, and his mood could very quickly deteriorate. When he lost his temper, she said, she was afraid of him. At times, he would become verbally aggressive, yelling and raging at her and the kids, although there was no evidence of any physical violence toward Nicole or the girls. What would happen in the Ridge Street townhouse in May of 2017 would shock the nation of Australia. On May 20th, 2017, Maddie was exactly one month shy of her third birthday, and she, like many toddlers the same age, was not yet entirely potty trained. Around four o'clock on that Saturday afternoon, Maddie soiled her nappy or her diaper. We may never know why this mundane event was the catalyst for the horrific tragedy that was about to unfold. 
In many of the stories I research, potty training frustrations have led to abused and murdered children, but I've never heard about a more protracted, torturous method of abuse being used against an innocent two-year-old because of a potty accident. Instead of cleaning Maddie up and outfitting her in a clean diaper, Shane stripped his daughter's clothes off, stood her in the bathtub, and cranked on the hot water tap. He then held Maddie, but first, under a roaring stream of scalding hot water that was eventually determined to be 60 degrees Celsius, which equates to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. A little PSA here. The ideal temperature for a child's bath is somewhere in the neighborhood of 37 to 38 degrees Celsius, which you may recognize as nowhere near 60 degrees. In fact, most doctors recommend setting the maximum temperature on your household hot water heater to 120 degrees Fahrenheit to avoid injury, even for adults. This assault by hot water caused immediate and excruciating pain, which absolutely would have led to Maddie screaming and crying. Experts said that the subsequent burns Maddie suffered were severe enough to indicate that she was held under that scalding stream for about 30 seconds. If that doesn't sound very long to you, pause this podcast, set a timer for 30 seconds, and envision someone pouring the hottest water you can imagine over your most sensitive areas for the entire time. There is no doubt whatsoever that it felt like an eternity to little Maddie, who probably had no idea why she was being punished in the first place. Before her father finally turned off the hot water, Maddie had suffered second- and third-degree burns over 20% of her little body. Only the heels and balls of her feet, where the skin of the human body is typically thickest, were unscathed. Now let's talk about burns for a minute. Some of this might be tough to listen to. First-degree burns are also known as superficial burns, affecting only the outermost layer of skin. They cause minimal damage like redness, minor swelling, pain, and some skin peeling as the burn heals. We've all gotten these before, whether from accidentally touching a hot pot or stovetop. In my craftier days, I was frequently guilty of inadvertently inflicting them on myself via hot glue gun. First-degree burns hurt like hell, but they can easily be treated with a little first aid at home. Maddie's burns were all more serious than that. Second-degree burns cause damage beyond the first layer of skin and cause the skin to redden and blister. These burns are exceptionally painful, and it's imperative to keep the affected area clean and bandage it properly to prevent infection. Most second-degree burns heal within two to three weeks without scarring, although you might see changes in skin pigment in the area. If the burns are in a widespread area like the face, hands, buttocks, groin, or feet, emergency medical treatment should be sought. Maddie was burned all over her buttocks, groin, legs, and feet. Her most severe burns were third-degree or full-thickness burns, which are life-threatening injuries that require medical attention. I'm just going to recommend right now that you don't look up photos of third-degree burns unless you have a very strong stomach. I did, and I regret it. Third-degree burns destroy all layers of the skin, and the damage can even penetrate the fat layer beneath the skin. These burns can cause bleeding. The nerve endings are destroyed, and the burned area can appear white, gray, or black, with a waxy, leathery, or even charred appearance. According to the World Health Organization, or WHO, any full-thickness burn requires hospitalization, but anyone with third-degree burns covering more than 10% of the body needs to be admitted to a hospital with a special burn unit for treatment. Again, Maddie's burns covered 20% of her body. Large third-degree burns cannot heal without skin grafts or other surgery and require long-term scar care. A feeding tube may be inserted because the body requires extra energy due to heat loss, tissue regeneration, and other effects of trauma. Lost fluids must be replaced to avoid dehydration. The burns themselves, due to nerve damage, may not even hurt. These burns, especially when untreated, carry with them a much higher risk of complications, such as dehydration, infection, and sepsis. Sepsis is essentially blood poisoning, which can damage multiple organ systems, cause them to fail, and even result in death. As I mentioned, the instant pain obviously caused poor little Maddie to shriek, which drew her mother's attention. When Nicole came into the bathroom, she later told police, she saw Shane holding Madeline out of the bathwater. Seeing the state of her daughter's injuries, Nicole told Shane she wanted to call an ambulance, but he was vehemently opposed to that idea. He told Nicole that if they called triple zero, the Australian emergency number, child safety officers would become involved, and their home would be overrun for God knows how long by case managers like the last time they proved their parental ineptitude when child safety became involved due to Maddie's malnutrition. Fearing her daughters would be taken away, Nicole acquiesced, and the couple ultimately agreed to treat Maddie's burns themselves. They gathered bandages, ointments, children's painkillers, 
and other first aid materials with which Nicole would be largely responsible for treating their two-year-old's life-threatening burns. Guess how well that turned out. Four days later, on Wednesday, May 24, 2017, an unknown party summoned police to the townhouse, where, evidently, someone was yelling and raging inside. Police arrived and diffused whatever situation they encountered, completely unaware that somewhere inside the home, Maddie lay gravely ill, fighting an infection running rampant through her little body. The following day, Maddie could fight no longer. At 3.22 p.m. on Thursday, May 25th, Nicole Moore called triple zero and reported that her two-year-old daughter, Madeline Rose, wasn't breathing. When paramedics responded, they found a tiny, blonde toddler, unresponsive, in cardiac arrest, and they tried for 20 long minutes to resuscitate her before finally obtaining a thready pulse, at which point the tiny girl was loaded into an ambulance and rushed to Lady Salento Children's Hospital on Stanley Street in South Brisbane. Court documents later describe Maddie's dire state upon admission. She had signs of septic shock, hypovolemic shock, and cardiogenic shock. The burns were grossly infected and soiled. She had a hypoxic ischemic brain injury, secondary to the cardiac arrest. All that medical gobbledygook means that Maddie suffered from a catastrophic blood infection, she had lost more than one-fifth of her body's volume of blood and other fluids, and her heart couldn't pump enough oxygen to the rest of her vital organs. Then, after her heart stopped, oxygen deprivation had caused brain damage. Maddie was placed into a medically induced coma and never regained consciousness. She endured further cardiac arrests, and eventually, the decision was made to withdraw life support. At 11.44 p.m. on May 25, 2017, less than a month before her third birthday, Madeline Rose Ava Stokes was pronounced dead. Her cause of death was determined to be sepsis as a consequence of the burns she had suffered five days before. Shane Stokes told police that on May 22nd, he had left Maddie and her older sister in the bathtub, and when he returned three to five minutes later, H.J. had gotten out of the tub and turned off the cold water tap, leaving Maddie sitting in the scalding water. Later, he said, he ran Maddie a cold bath, and afterward, he and Nicole applied antiseptic cream to the baby's burns before bandaging them. Shane had told police that Maddie hadn't seemed to be in much pain and was drinking water up until the day they called triple zero, which would eventually prove false. According to Shane, even though Maddie had been unable to walk due to the severity of her burns, they did not seek medical help, consulting instead with Dr. Google. Nicole told investigators that she heard Maddie scream and ran to the bathroom to find Shane holding the baby out of the bathwater. The day after Maddie's death, on Friday, May 26, 2017, police established an investigation center at the police station in nearby Boondal, launching a major investigation codenamed Operation Papa Belvedere to establish the circumstances around Maddie's injuries and death. Involved in the operation were members of the Boondal Child Protection Investigation Unit, the Child Trauma Task Force, and the Homicide Squad. Scientific officers remained at the house through Friday afternoon and were expected to remain for several days or as long as the investigation took. Detective Inspector Tim Trezise told the media that at first glance, Maddie's injuries seemed consistent with her parents' stories. Their version is that it's a terrible accident and that a moment's inattention has led to this incident. However, due to the very, very serious nature of these burns and the fact that they were so serious that they quite likely caused her death, we have a very open mind in relation to other possibilities. The detective said police didn't want to leave any stone unturned, appealing for any witnesses or anyone with information to come forward. In these scary and difficult times, amidst a global pandemic that has affected every aspect of our lives, people are searching for helpers. Little do we know, they're everywhere. On every episode of the Hero Makers podcast, Hosts Lori Nichols and Ann Chow have spirited discussions with a diverse lineup of guests on a wide variety of topics, including homelessness, human trafficking, mental health, race, culture, music, art, and many more. This month, they sat down with Darcy Olson, founder of Generation Justice, a nonprofit organization dedicated to mending the child protection system by helping children's court cases, changing laws and policies, and enforcing children's constitutional rights. With guests like these and many others, the Hero Makers podcast is both entertaining and essential. Follow the Hero Makers podcast on your favorite podcast platform and visit the Hero Makers Movement website by clicking the link in today's show notes. With all the video conferencing and virtual meetings going on these days, we all want to look our best. If you're like me, you're probably confused by all the different methods of teeth whitening on the market. 
Now that I'm partnering with Smile Brilliant, I've learned a few things that you might find helpful about home teeth whitening methods. For example, LED lights are a novelty item. Whitening strips neglect the gum lines, crevices, and molars. Charcoal is abrasive and wears down your enamel. And whitening toothpaste only works on surface stains. So if none of these miracle products really works, what does? The number one product recommended by dentists is the custom-fitted tray, which usually costs an arm and a leg because they require a dentist to make them by hand using a model of your teeth. With Smile Brilliant's Lab Direct process, you can get custom-fitted teeth whitening trays at a fraction of the price without a single visit to the dentist. Using an exact model of your teeth, Smile Brilliant's lab technicians will handcraft your trays to give you the best possible whitening results. All you have to do is visit smilebrilliant.com, and when you order their system, make sure you use the coupon code CHILDREN at checkout for 30% off. When you receive the package from Smile Brilliant, it's really simple. You just make your dental impressions at home and return them using the prepaid envelope they provide you. In a matter of one week, Smile Brilliant will have your trays back in the mail. Using my coupon code, CHILDREN, means you're supporting me while saving a huge amount of money. So check out smilebrilliant.com today. Some rumors were already swirling in the public that Maddie's burns were several days old, and experts alleged the burns had been ignored instead of being treated. Immediately, the Australian government came under fire as citizens began pointing fingers of blame every which way. Child Safety Minister Shannon Fentiman quickly made a statement, saying, I can confirm that the Department of Child Safety was not currently investigating or involved with this family at the time of this tragic incident. My heart breaks for the family and friends of this little girl. There are many people grieving today. We all need to be respectful of the police investigation underway. She acknowledged that Maddie's parents were already known to the Department of Child Safety due to the earlier child cruelty charges and that the family was understood to have been working with child safety until up to 12 months before Maddie's death. She also said police were working with the family who was fully cooperating with the investigation. Queensland opposition leader Tim Nichols also made a public statement. Just for context, the opposition leader is a member of parliament in the House of Representatives. This position is held by a leader of the party that has the fewest House seats. Nichols' statement was openly and unapologetically critical of Minister Fentiman's statement. The minister seems to be playing word games with little kids' lives. He added that there needed to be a thorough investigation into Maddie's death. And it needs to be better than the investigations we've seen so far into the tragic death of Mason Jet Lee. The case Nichols referenced was that of Mason Jet Lee, a 21-month-old boy from Caboolture north of Brisbane, who died in June of 2016 after his stepfather punched him hard enough in the stomach to rupture his intestine. Mason's mother and stepfather then failed to seek medical treatment for Mason, which, like in Maddie's case, caused the little boy's death. They were ultimately convicted of manslaughter in 2019. Immediately after Maddie's death, however, there was a lot of derision toward the government for the substandard handling of Mason's case by the Department of Child Safety. Coroner Jane Bentley eventually wrote in a report that Mason's case was a failure in nearly every possible way by child safety, adding, Indeed, it is difficult to find any step taken in this case that was carried out in accordance with policies and procedures and correctly documented. Much like here in America, the press was all over anyone who knew anything about the family. One neighbor told Nine News that she had no idea anything was wrong until she saw an ambulance and police cars. There is never any sound comes from there, no indication that there was something wrong. I believe this may be the same neighbor who later gave a more extensive interview to the Daily Mail Australia, which I'll talk about in a little while. The same day, on Facebook, Shane's brother, Glyn, posted after being notified of his niece's death, writing, Shane Stokes and Nikki, how could you do this to my niece? Don't lie. Tell the truth so your own little girl can have justice. The following day, he posted again, I know it ain't no accident. They were horrible. I called families on him a year ago. Did they cut me? Everything. All social media and phones and moved. And at work Friday night, I get a call telling me my darling niece had died at midnight the night before. Monsters, I say. On May 27th, a plumber joined investigators at the townhouse to run tests, which included refilling the bathtub to see if the hot water system was working correctly. At that time, Shane and Nicole were named as persons of interest, but various news outlets reported it could be weeks before police decided whether or not to lay charges. On Sunday, May 28th, Seven News aired an interview with an emotional Glenn Stokes. This Friday gone, I found out that my niece is no longer with us. There's no words for how it feels. Happy, go lucky little baby. Um, Little joy to have in life.
After investigating for several days, on the morning of Monday, June 5, 2017, police arrested Shane Stokes and Nicole Moore, charging them with the murder of Madeline Rose. Detective Inspector Tim Trezise again spoke to the media. Uh, the investigation has been particularly difficult and emotionally challenging uh, due to the nature of the victim being a two-year-old girl uh, suffering severe injuries. It'll be alleged that the injuries that she suffered uh, were life-threatening burns to her back, buttocks, groin and legs. Obviously, any allegations of trial cruelty, it's treated very seriously. I'd like to thank uh, the many police officers, members of other government departments and members of the community who supported and provided information. After Shane and Nicole's arrests, the crime scene at the townhouse was released, and Shane and Nicole spent the night in the Brisbane Watch House, which is kind of like a county jail here. Watch houses are usually attached to and run by police stations, and they're built to hold people for a short time between arrest and initial court appearance. On Tuesday, June 6th, the couple appeared separately in the dock of the Brisbane Magistrates Court, where they were unable to apply for bail. After the hearing, they were remanded into custody. It took some assistance from the police, but on June 7th, Maddie's uncle, Glenn, was finally able to have the two-year-old's body released to him so he could plan a funeral, which he paid for, at least in part, by creating a GoFundMe campaign. Maddie's funeral took place on June 14th and was attended by a couple dozen mourners wearing bright colors at Glenn's request. On a pedestal at the front of the hall rested Maddie's tiny white coffin with silver handles, adorned with a large arrangement of pink and white flowers, and surrounded by multiple teddy bears, sitting atop a froth of pink and white tulle. Celebrant Robin Ryder spoke reverently of the little girl, for whom she lit a candle during the ceremony and sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow. I love the place where I am now. There are children to play with, there's plenty to do, and there are rainbows everywhere. Have you ever watched a butterfly? Its beauty so delicate and rare. All the colours of the rainbow, you can't help but stop and stare. I don't know why in the greater plan their stay should be so short. One of nature's many wonders with a spirit that can't be taught. And now your little butterfly has faded from your sight. She wasn't meant for this hard world. Now she has wings of flight. So just as a butterfly graces our lives with one moment's fragile beauty, so too has Maddie's presence blessed you and those around you. May you find peace and joy with each butterfly that passes by, knowing that Maddie lives on in the hearts of all she touched. Remember her, your little butterfly, let her memory linger long, for while you hold her in your hearts, She is never truly gone. The only family member who was able to speak before the crowd was Maddie's young cousin, Lil, who appeared to be around 12 years old. Madeline was, she was very cute and bubbly and happy. But now that she's gone in such a horrific way, she will be missed very, very much. During the funeral, Glenn sat near the front of the room, crying with his head in his hands. Some mourners rose when directed to place flowers on and around Maddie's coffin. After the funeral, the family released balloons, and the immediate family also released butterflies in Maddie's memory. Glenn later shared a video of the funeral on Facebook, after which he spoke with the Daily Mail Australia. I am very proud about the funeral we were able to give her, but it was shattering that I had to do it. My whole life has been turned on its head. I feel so lost and alone. On June 11, 2017, the Daily Mail Australia spoke with neighbors at the public housing complex, including the townhouse where Maddie was injured. An elderly man living in one of the front units, who was partially deaf and cared for his wife, who had dementia, said he rarely saw Madeline Rose, but even so, the situation had greatly affected him. I didn't see anything or hear anything that would attract my attention. I was crying to think a two- to three-year-old child could be treated like that. The neighbor I spoke of earlier, 62-year-old Rhonda Jones, said she believed the family had lived in the townhouse for one to two years, but she didn't even know the names of anyone in the family until seeing Maddie's death in the news. She had lived there for about 12 years. I only ever saw him and her and the child that used to go to daycare. I knew there was another one, but I never used to see her very often. They just seemed a normal family, just normal people. They were very quiet and no one spoke to them. They just kept to themselves. No one knew their names. We do now. It's really sad. Occasionally you'd hear a child crying because kids cry. Kids fall over and hurt themselves, but it wasn't like a scream in pain or anything. 
Nothing unusual. Rhonda told the reporter she rarely spoke to anyone besides the aforementioned elderly neighbor. Some of the other people we never see for weeks on end. Everyone just keeps to themselves around here. You'd think someone would have heard something. If I had heard someone screaming, I would have run to the police. If someone knew what was happening, someone would have called the police. The only time I realized something was wrong was when the police and ambulance arrived. I just saw the police and the ambulance going down there. I didn't think the police or ambulance would be going there. Never in my wildest dreams would I have thought it was them. I thought they were going to my elderly neighbors. There were so many cars and so many people. It's quite frightening to think we never heard a thing. That's the scary part. It's so tragic. The same newspaper interviewed Glenn Stokes, who said he would have been happy to add Madeline Rose to his brood of three children. I still can't put into words how I feel about it. I'm just so angry, and I get really upset every time I think about it. I don't know how to tell my kids that they will never have the chance to meet their cousin. And I think it is even harder when I look at my own daughter, who is only a little bit younger, because I can imagine what she is like. After learning of his brother and sister-in-law's arrests, Glynn said, he was appalled. I am very sad and will hold my kids tighter tonight. It never should have come to this. By June 12th, Australian news stations obtained court and police documents indicating that Shane gave authorities multiple stories about the cause of Maddie's injuries. First, there was the story that on May 22nd, he left Maddie standing in the bathtub with both the hot and cold taps running and the plug out when he left the room to go to the toilet. Wait, wasn't he already in the bathroom? And who leaves the plug out and the water running like that? Anyway, Shane apparently said he had heard Maddie start screaming 30 seconds later, but he didn't return to the room for three to five minutes afterward, at which point he found her sitting under the hot water while her sister stood beside the bath. Just sitting there, huh? Rather than seeking medical help, he said, he and Nicole researched burns online and decided to treat Maddie themselves with aloe vera gel and bandages. When she stopped breathing three days later, he said, that was when they called triple zero. According to a hospital pediatrician, a burn specialist, and a forensic pathologist, however, Maddie's injuries were not consistent with Shane's story. Court documents read, Further, the injuries are consistent with Madeline being held in a standing position, underwater, in excess of 60 degrees Celsius for a period in excess of 30 seconds. Reporters were also all over the news that Nicole, too, gave differing statements, initially telling police she'd heard Madeline scream and ran upstairs to find Stokes holding her out of the bathwater. She later said she'd gone upstairs to find Shane in the kids' bedroom after calling her name. The most damning news of all, though, was a revelation that, according to mobile phone records, Nicole and Shane had searched burn treatments all the way back on May 20th, two entire days before the date Shane told police Maddie was injured. The couple later admitted they had lied about when the burns had occurred, fearing they'd get into trouble. Shane then said he'd washed Madeline in the bath on May 20th after she soiled her diaper, a version that was consistent with her injuries, but which he later retracted. The court documents also stated in no uncertain terms that had Shane and Nicole sought medical help, Maddie would undoubtedly have survived. Now let's jump forward in time, because between June of 2017 and February of this year, there was absolutely no mention of this case whatsoever in the news. But apparently, prosecutors were working behind the scenes to resolve the case. At long last, on Friday, February 19, 2021, in Queensland Supreme Court in Brisbane, 33-year-old Shane David Stokes and 26-year-old Nicole Betty Moore pleaded guilty to diminished charges of manslaughter and cruelty to a child for failing to seek medical attention. In addition, Shane alone pleaded guilty to one count of grievous bodily harm as he had admitted to causing Maddie's injuries by holding her under scalding hot running water. During the hearing, the couple remained unmoved as the details of Maddie's injuries were presented to the court. Horrific new information was revealed at the hearing. One of Maddie's teeth had been broken by unknown means in the days prior to her death, and a photo taken in the hospital bed showed a visible bruise on her forehead. The autopsy found, In excess of 50 wounds, bruises, and abrasions on your daughter's head, torso, and arms. The agreed facts say that some are consistent with non-accidental injury. That wasn't even counting the burns on her lower body. While searching the home, authorities found children's pain relievers, as well as several items stained with blood, including bandages, toilet paper, wet makeup cleaning pads, and two mattresses. The bandages were also stained with pus from Maddie's seeping, infected wounds. Crown Prosecutor Sarah Farndon told the court, She would have been in great misery and pain over that period of time, unable to walk. She would have been dehydrated and weak, unable to eat and drink properly possibly vomiting. 
she likely became delirious and unconscious before ultimately going into cardiac arrest and ceasing breathing. The prosecutor said medical experts determined it would have been obvious that Maddie needed urgent emergency treatment and that her injuries would have likely worsened over time. A blood analysis had revealed that Maddie had been given mirtazapine, one of the antidepressants prescribed to her father, which the prosecutor said Shane gave to Maddie to quieten or tranquilize her prior to her death. A clinical psychologist assessed Shane in a pre-sentencing report as having a persistent depressive disorder originating in your juvenile years and a post-traumatic stress disorder either since or from before your daughter's death with underlying features of a borderline personality disorder. Included in your exchanges with the psychologist, you made a number of statements that reflect upon the harm you inflicted upon your daughter and your subsequent failure to take steps to obtain medical assistance to remove her from the danger to her life and health. At no stage have you directly acknowledged how you held her, standing in the bath, while the hot water ran down her lower back and legs. Shane's defense lawyer, Owen Mac Giola Ree, said Maddie's death was not an act of deliberation, but a case of parents doing their incompetent best. He said the couple made the decision not to call an ambulance because the injuries likely appeared a lot less severe when they were first inflicted. He said, As the need to call the ambulance increased, the consequences for them calling the ambulance also increased. They would have been stuck in a cycle of increasing symptoms. Surprisingly, there was no pre-sentencing psychiatric or psychological report prepared for Nicole. The diagnosis presented for her was recurrent depressive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. While awaiting trial, Nicole's prescribed medication included amitriptyline, an antidepressant for major depression that is sometimes marketed under the brand name Elevil, as well as two antipsychotics, quetiapine and aripiprazil, better known as Seroquel and Abilify. Nicole's lawyer, Lars Falkengreen, said his client didn't cause Maddie's injuries and believed Shane's story that her older daughter caused them. She never received any other story than that. She wanted to call an ambulance, and yes, she should have revisited this again and again as things progressively declined. But it was not done by malice or lack of caring. She feared her daughter would be taken from her by the Department of Child Safety Intervention, and she deluded herself that her daughter would get better. She managed to perform a ridiculous self-delusion to imagine the child would turn a corner. On Monday, February 22, 2021, Shane Stokes and Nicole Moore were sentenced by Justice David Jackson, who noted that both defendants had expressed to the court what was deemed to be a legitimate remorse for their involvement in their daughter's death. During his ruling, the judge said Maddie's death was dreadful and beyond tragic. None of it should have happened. Your abject failure to carry out your duties as parents at any time after she was burned caused her death. The conduct is incomprehensible. It's horrifying to contemplate the suffering your daughter endured at your hands. All right-thinking people must be revulsed by it. He said they had never given a truthful account of what happened to Maddie, and he chastised them for their selfish decisions. Your concerns were for yourselves, at your daughter's expense. It cost your daughter's life. The initial decision was culpable enough, but the culpability was compounded over and over again as her condition worsened and you did nothing to help until after she had stopped breathing. The greatest tragedy is that had you taken her promptly to hospital, called triple zero, her life would have been saved and she would have received proper pain relief. She would not have had to endure almost five days of excruciating pain suffered by the victim of untreated and serious burns. You both bear full responsibility for both of those outcomes. Shane received a sentence of 11 years in remand, and Nicole was sentenced to nine years and six months. Both will serve their sentences in protective custody. Justice Jackson declined to make any recommendation for early parole, and no parole eligibility date was set. The 1,358 days each of them spent in pre-sentence custody was considered time served. If parole is not granted, Shane's sentence should end around June of 2028. Nicole's should be completed around December of 2026. If she was alive today, Madeline Rose Ava Stokes would be turning seven on June 20, 2021. At the projected end of her mother's sentence, she would be 12, and at the end of her father's, she would be 14. She should be growing up with her older sister, sharing secrets and giggling and bickering, and she should be in grade one at primary school. Instead, Maddie will remain forever, too, not yet potty trained, with her fine, blonde baby hair and her precious, chubby baby cheeks. Thanks to her father's temper and her parents' callous disregard for her very life, Maddie will never celebrate her third birthday. It's a shame that very little is known about Maddie herself, 
but even so, people all over the world now know her story, and she will never be forgotten. Rest in peace, Madeline Rose. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another case. If you like the show, please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. And please subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at www.sufferthelittlechildrenpod.com where you can listen to episodes and become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod and on Twitter at STLCPod. View photos related to today's case on Facebook and Instagram. Read more about today's case and many others at SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast was written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dream Note Music. Other music and sound effects for the show were created using sounds from AudioJungle.net. Hug your babies a bit closer tonight. Until next week, bye guys. <laughs>